There you go. Now we're in business. Okay, now we're in business. Okay. Um, so anyway, we're going to start with this. Um, a couple of announcements that we want to do here. Amy, Amy, go to presenter mode. Go to go to presenter mode. There you go. Okay. I thought about that this morning. I always think about you. You always tell me <laughs> that. And I want to make sure that I was there and I wasn't. <sighs> so anyway, okay. Um, so we're going to get started here. So a couple of announcements. So a lot of you I know already personally, if I see a name, like let's say I see Brian Stevens, I know who that is. Um, but some of you I may not know um, who, or let's say I saw somebody that popped up that had the name recorder. So please make sure that you put your first and last name. An email address. Um, in the chat box, just so that we know what community um, you are representing. If you do not put that in um, the chat box, you will not receive credit for the webinar. So I just want to make sure that we have everybody identified. If you're coming in on a phone number or different things, um, you want to make sure that you put your contact information in here. So Today we're going to be talking about um, floodplain management and administrative duties, and then we're also going to be talking about the um, floodplain management permit guide. So I feel like um, Julius and I have been together now a little over a year, um, which has been wonderful. And I think one of our um, shining stars that we have for um, floodplain management is to be able to have this permitting guide because a lot of times people struggle with administrative procedures and what to do. So again, we're going to be talking about floodplain management, administrative duties, what you guys should be doing on a day in um, and day out uh, for floodplain management. So some of the things we're going to be talking about is how do you make a floodplain mapping determination? A lot of times when I get questions from folks um, that haven't made a determination or um, you know, like uh, lately people just kind of send like a rectangle, I'm sorry, um, yeah, a rectangle and they don't have the uh, parcel number, they don't have the street address when they're asking us for help with that. So whenever you guys are asking uh, myself a question or Julius a question or both of us a question, guys need to make sure you have the who, what, where, when, why, right? Where is property located? Where is the floodplain determination? Um, do you know if you're not sure that's a, another issue and then making sure that you issue and review development permits when someone comes into the office, making sure that you have that documentation to detail what type of development um, is being proposed on the lot, reviewing the site plan to make sure it's done by a licensed um, Tennessee surveyor. And then over the counter consultation, um, a lot of times. When folks come in and they have a question, um, sometimes you guys can feel a little bit overwhelmed, a little bit anxious with it. But having the um, flow flame management permitting guide kind of helps you understand some of the topics you should be addressing when you're talking to someone. If you still have questions, you can ask Julius and I. But it's always a good thing to kind of have as much information as you can. Um, when you're asking us questions and then reviewing elevation certificates and inspecting development, making sure that it's compliant with your regulations and then maintaining documentation. So last Thursday I was kind of in a snow globe and it was snowing a lot um, and I went to um, East Tennessee and one of the things we talked about was trying to maintain documentation because a lot of you guys when you start your job, the person that was there before you may or may not have had a good filing system, right? You may walk into the office, you're able to determine where a lot of the documentation is located. You're able to easily retrieve information. And then there's a greater majority of you um, that either don't want to look for it, don't know where it's located, or you have to go to this scary room that smells like mold and try to go through old boxes. Um, and so that can make it kind of difficult um, trying to find uh, documentation. But so Julius and I have been working on administrative procedures so that when I come and do community visits, um, we're starting to have paper copies of things to give to communities as well as 
electronic files um, to help folks kind of start a new filing system for floodplain management. And then as part of the administrative duties, making sure that you investigate violations. Um, if someone calls and they see something, um, hey, or like hey, when Amy, I was talking to someone hey, yesterday. Amy, hey, Amy, quick question. Um, sure. We got a message from Evan. I think some people are maybe on Cheyenne's invite and not on your invite. Yeah, there were like 30 something people on that other one. Evan, so, um, so Amy, I'm going to switch okay. out and just I'm just going to log in and tell them to switch to your invite. OK, Did I'll I be back. OK, thank you. OK, um, and then also um, attending trainings. So one announcement that I will make um, is that Cheyenne um, was offered a promotional position and is no longer with the state NFIP office. So last Friday was her last day, and then um, we will be looking for someone new. So it's going to be me for a while. So again, if you guys ask questions and you need things and it maybe takes a little bit longer than normal, um, please be patient. So floodplain mapping determination. Um, one of the first things that you should do as a floodplain administrator is to determine if the parcel is in a special flood hazard area. And so there's different websites we've talked about before using the Tennessee Property Viewer the FEMA Map Service Center website, and then also using um, the FEMA National Flood Hazard Layer. So when you are making a determination, this is a good example of having Zone AE, um, Shaded Zone X, areas in a floodplain. So Tennessee is lucky that it has ortho imagery on um, the flood insurance rate maps, and then you also are able to have parcel lines um, on the flood insurance rate maps to make a determination. So Tennessee is leaps and bounds ahead of other um, states when it comes to floodplain mapping, because uh, when I first started my career, I've told this story a, a number of times, is that, um, that you're able to, um, or before I would look at maps and have to have a ruler and try to determine um, where, the floodplain was located and then having to go and do even more research was sometimes tedious. So having the parcel lines um, can kind of help a floodplain administrator make an easy determination. And then um, it also helps the surveyor as well, because you, if a surveyor draws it, you look at it, it doesn't necessarily look correct. You can look online to see um, whether or not it's valid. And if um, sometimes at the the floodplain area on the lot looks weird. You can always ask them to download the national flood hazard layer within their GIS to um, make a determination. So again, floodplain development permits. Every single community that participates in the national flood insurance program should have uh, a development permit. Now you could have a, a development permit, let's say a building permit that has floodplain information. You could have the sample statewide floodplain permit, or you could use from the um, floodplain management permitting guide. We also have a fillable PDF, but there should always be documentation to know when a development was initiated, when a permit was issued, the type of development that's occurring on the lot, and making sure um, that you have floodplain information listed on um, the permit is really important. And again, um, you know, even if it's just filling and grading on the lot, you need to have that. If it's an accessory structure, there needs to be that determination. Um, but again, having that over-the-counter consultation, looking at the map to make a determination is really crucial to get started. And then this is an example of the Word version as well as a fillable PDF. Now, a lot of times people say, well, hey, Amy, which one should I use? And again, that kind of comes up to personal preference because some communities are more sophisticated than others with technology. And so it has to be based upon what you're going to be comfortable using. There's some people that just like the Word version because it's just quick, it's simple. Um, and then there's others that maybe have more technology in their community and just want to have a fillable PDF available. So again, reviewing a site plan, making sure that plans 
are drawn oh. in duplicate and they're drawn to scale. And again, they're going to show the nature of the lot, location of the lot, dimensions of the lot, um, elevations of the area in question, existing or proposed structures. If there's a uh, fill being placed on the lot, the exact location, we always tell people to have a pre and post fill site plan with elevations because sometimes it could come back that let's say you have a major subdivision and the developer did not um, submit a letter of map revision based upon fill. If you have that site plan to show pre and post fill with elevations, if somebody's doing a letter of map revision based upon fill and you have to sign off on the community acknowledgement form, um, that is a way that you can do that and have that documentation. And I, I apologize for interrupting. I just wanted to let you know that there was a previous log on for the meeting that was sent out and uh, there were several people on the other log in. Uh, I, I jumped back and forth. I went back to tell them that you were on this newer log in that was sent out, what, yesterday or the day before? And, uh, but I just wanted to let you know that there were several people over there trying to get in. So. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Julius right. was trying to wrangle everybody over here. I appreciate that. Uh, and then also having drainage facilities on the site plan. So again, making sure that all the I's are dotted, T's are crossed um, for this is really important. And again, if you don't feel that the site plan adequately shows everything, you can ask the surveyor to revise it. You can also um, take the text that's within your flood damage prevention regulations and state that all these different elements need to be on there as well. And then over the counter consultation, one of the biggest things that I think um, people struggle with, or maybe they don't think they're good enough at, is doing over the counter consultation. Because as a floodplain administrator, you are the star of the show, essentially, that if someone has a floodplain management question, they're going to come to you and ask you for help and assistance. So you want to make sure um, that you are attending trainings, that you've read the regulations, and that you and your staff, and a lot of you are just by yourself, I realize that, but for some of you that have staff to be able to um, provide over-the-counter consultation to kind of have a step one, you get a permit. Step two, you have a site plan. Step three, you tell them uh, the various regulations uh, pertaining to their specific development. And just kind of breaking it down into simple, um, actionable items uh, to help people is really important. So again, floodplain regulations compliance, making sure that you have uh, flood damage prevention regulations um, in your notebook. Um, a lot of times when I go out to visit different communities and I talk about where's your regulations. Um, one time I was doing an audit and the floodplain administrator had her zoning book, her notebook out and ha had a tab, let's say for uh, section nine, and it was completely blank. She didn't know that there was floodplain regulations that had to be in there. They were adopted. They just never, ever made it into her notebook. Um, and I just talked to someone yesterday that's working with the community. Um, they can't find their regulations whatsoever. So one of the first things that I would recommend um, when you guys get off the call today is to make sure that you have a copy, that you have a signed and dated copy in your notebook, right? If you don't use a notebook and you just do everything on your computer to make sure that you have a Word document, that you have a PDF, but make sure that you have that available so that when someone asks you a question, you're able to reference the regulations. Um, is really important because some of you guys may have a higher free board requirements. You may have higher elevation standards in other communities. Um, you may want to reference that or just tab some of the different sections so that you know um, more specific standards are at. So again, having elevation standards for residential, non-residential structures. Uh, what are your standards for enclosures? If you have a manufactured home, uh, area where you have manufactured homes coming in or recreational vehicle placement, exactly what are the standards for the National Flood Insurance Program? As a floodplain administrator, what should I be telling folks that come in to see me? That's really important. And then new subdivisions. There are some provisions within the flood damage prevention regulations for mobile homes for new subdivisions. So you want to make sure that you have that to make sure your utilities are elevated, roads, 
um, are elevated and um, the placement of where all that's going to be. If it's a zone A, let's say I have a large farm that's becoming a major subdivision. If it's 50 lots or five acres, I've got to have a BFE determined uh, stream encroachments. There has to be an engineering analysis done prior to the commencement of any development activity and then having utility location and elevation um, is important and having all that information. So I was at, uh, I was doing an audit uh, last week. And one of the things that we looked at was a site plan and it was a structure for a zone A. And you guys always hear me say that you gotta have the four corners of the house, right? You gotta have the four points to figure out which elevation is the highest. And so we were sitting there looking at the site plan and three out of the four corners of the home had elevations in the south eastern corner did not have um, an elevation. So it was you couldn't determine whether or not the structure was built three feet above the hag because you didn't have that other elevation on there. So again, just taking your time whenever you guys get this to look at it. If you're not comfortable with looking at it, uh, Julius and I have office hours every Monday that we meet with communities to go through different um, development proposals to make sure that they're compliant. So if you have questions or you need assistance, um, we do pretty much give the whole day on Monday um, to doing uh, meetings with communities and just trying to answer questions and stuff. So I always know every Sunday night that Monday morning, I'm gonna be talking to Julius a lot. Um, so we just try to help communities that way with different issues and different topics. So again, we're just a phone call or email away. We do have WebEx. And sometimes if the um, property owner wants to be on those calls, we also do that as well. So again, we try to be really open, really transparent um, with communities and with uh, property owners as far as the NFIP regulations. And then maintaining documentation. Um, you wanna make sure that you keep the files forever. Um, so if you have old flood insurance rate maps, you wanna keep them. If you uh, have letter of map changes, you wanna have those um, in a filing system that's easily retrievable, which is important. And then investigating violations, you wanna make sure that you investigate violations that um, occur based upon your um, flood damage prevention regulations and then initiate corrective action. Um, one thing that I will say, we've had a couple questions um, this week. Um, if there's some sort of issue where there's unpermitted work being done, it is up to the local community to initiate um, a stop work order and take in legal action. The state NFIP office, as much as you guys would like me to, I do not have policing powers. I can't stop someone from doing something um, that they're not supposed to. So again, it's up to local community. If your um, local attorney, whether it be city or municipal or county is unaware of the NFIP regulations, you know, when you guys have yearly trainings or if they just happen to pop by your office or you see them, make sure that you talk about the National Flood Insurance Program because um, it seems as time has gone on, there's been a uptick of unpermitted work being done in communities. And so you want to make sure that your legal staff understands the NFIP, understands some of the um, Code of Federal Regulations and that you can not take action if there is unpermitted work in a community. So again, we have all kinds of trainings um, all year long. We do them in person. We do them virtually. We have a webinar every month. Um, we are going to be scheduling the L273, the Intro to Floodplain Management. Um, I believe we're going to be doing it in May. Uh, this year. And then we also have the intro to floodplain management, the three day virtual course. A lot of you guys um, have taken that, have enjoyed it. Uh, Julius um, was really a trendsetter in getting it started because uh, not everybody can get away from the office and go somewhere for L273, but having it virtual where, you know, six hours a day you get to hear <laughs> Julius and I talk. Um, is really good and then we also have trainings on an as-needed basis so um the city of knoxville wanted to have advanced um, nfip training course so julius and i took a half a day and did one just for the city of knoxville i think back in december so again if there's a training that you would like to see um, just let us know if it's something where you have um, a lot of staff that you want us to just do specialized for your community um we will put it into the schedule as time permits. 
Um, we do like to try to do as much as we can to try to help folks. And even if you're brand new and you say, okay, Amy, I don't want to do a class with everybody. I don't want people to know that I don't know much about the program. We have done individualized 101 trainings for different communities. So um, again, if you have needs, just let us know and we'll be happy to accommodate them. Yeah, the other thing to add, Amy, for trainings is for everyone visibility, there is a NFIP 101 on ASSPM website that FEMA has created. It's just housed on SSPM website, but it's a self-paced training class. Um, so every time we do audits, myself and Amy, we have in communities do that training. If you cannot attend like the L273 or you cannot attend the free day virtual or you cannot attend the monthly webinars, that is another option for local officials. So anybody could take that training. You just go on there and then take the training. You do get a certificate from FEMA. So if you need proof that you attended and completed the training course, you could get that as well too. So it's a really self place. You start it. If you start today, you could finish it a month, two months from now, but it's really self-paced. Um, we are in the process of updating it, adding some new materials uh, about substantial damage, Disaster Recovery Reform Act of 2018. Um, so there's different pieces to it. I am on that committee that's created that training course. So that's why I'm advocating for it because it's a really good class. It's self-paced and if you need additional support, it's a good class to take and anyone could take it. So definitely check it out. I'll drop it in the link. So if you have time and you need some additional training, but you just cannot attend the monthly webinars or you cannot attend the free day virtual or even an in-person, that is another option. So my goal when I came to Tennessee and speaking of Amy, one thing we wanted to do is make sure that there's there's a there's an option for trainings for everybody depending on your circumstance because not everyone could travel not everyone could do the monthly webinars but we still want to make sure that training is available to every community in tennessee so so you're going to have multiple options for training when it comes to learning about the nfip program good plug i concur yeah i mean especially the self pace um i think is really good for some of you guys that maybe don't like um the in-person stuff and you just kind of want to do it quiet or like on a day like today where it's cold and rainy and you just want to stay in and hunker down and learn more about the nfip um there's a, a myriad of choices available so again we're going to talk about the 2022 floodplain management permitting guide you got, it <laughs> you got it correct you got it correct we finally got able to get it correct so she kept changing the name when we created it I know. I'm um, hopefully you guys are laughing too, but it's good if you're muted because then I, you know, you can laugh with me and laugh at me. Um, so we're going to talk about the permitting guide. We did send it out back in September. If you're a new floodplain administrator and you don't have a copy of either the Word document or um, fillable PDF, just send me an email later and just say, send me the permitting guide, Amy, and I'll send it to you. Um, it does include a sample permit. It has a permit review checklist an elevation certificate checklist, and then how to use a Tennessee property viewer um, to make a, a floodplain determination. So this is what it looks like. It's really pretty. Um, Cheyenne helped us with the layout on this. Um, and we, Julius came, what, back in June. I remember we were sitting out at the conference room table <laughs> for a week um, putting this together. So there was a lot of um, love and enthusiasm um, with developing this document for you guys because again we're only strong we're as strong as our weakest link so what we want to do is kind of equip you to increase your comfortability and your confidence in doing floodplain management because that's the biggest thing I think um, in Tennessee that we struggle with is that people don't think that they're um, good enough to do it capable enough to do it and that's not um, the case we think a lot of you guys have um, the ability to do it well. Um, and again, like I tell people, it's kind of like a muscle. If you don't use it, you lose it. So no two cases that you have for development are ever the same. So it's a constant um, learning journey that you're going to have with this. Um, so again, it's just good to have um, an open uh, attitude and just wanting to learn all this. I think it, it's, I think floodplain management is fun. I talk about it a lot. <laughs> Um, and every time that I meet someone, I try to tell them a little bit about it. So again, you guys are our biggest um, cheerleaders and advertisers of the program. So the more that you learn, the more that you can help your friends, family, colleagues, stakeholders in your local communities. 
Yeah, the other plug on that, Amy, for the tenancy permitting guide. Um, this is version one. So over the years, Amy and I will keep adding on to it. We already received some feedback in terms of what folks would like to see, some additional like flow charts. So any opportunity you get, guys, when you utilize the, the permitting guide and you would like to see maybe a flow chart of hey, how is this process would work out, let us know those feedback. So now we could incorporate in version 2.0. So this is a, a, a living document that will be forever being updated as we add new pieces to it or we make changes, especially with the elevation certificate that's coming out, the new version. So we may have to go back and make another edit to it. So just be mindful that this document is, is a living document that's forever going to be updated. So we always send out the latest version so that way you guys are staying up to date on everything. So and if you have suggestions of things you want to see, um, definitely let us know and we'll be able to try to incorporate those suggestions into the latest update. So this just kind of has some of the code of federal regulations talking about how that is a community that there's a mandate that if you're going to participate that you have to um, issue floodplain development permits. They are required for all proposed construction or development. So again, when a community voluntarily decides to participate in the National Flood Insurance Program and they uh, adopt these standards, they have to issue permits. So sometimes when we go to communities and they go, oh, I didn't know I was supposed to do that. Well, it's in the Code of Federal Regulations. It's also um, within the Flood Damage Prevention Regulation. So again, um, it's a quid pro quo type program. Uh, as a community voluntarily participates in the National Flood Insurance Program, um, they're offered uh, flood insurance, disaster assistance. But on the flip side, the community is supposed to be enforcing these regulations uniformly um, across our community. So again, steps to be followed uh, for a local floodplain administrator is making sure that you do a determination if the parcel is in a special flood hazard area. There's a Tennessee property viewer, there's a FEMA map service center website, and there's also the FEMA national flood hazard layer. So those are three most prominent uh, websites. Most people, if they don't have a countywide or community-wide GIS system will use a Tennessee property viewer. You can click on um, show FEMA flood layer and then um, you can print or it'll say make a map and you can click on that and have a PDF of the map. It'll populate that for you. So it's really easy, very user friendly. Um, and then also requiring a development permit. So a development permit can be any kind of man-made change to improve or unapproved real estate including but not limited to. So you can have mining, dredging, grading, paving, filling, excavating, drainage facilities, or storage of machinery or equipment and structures on the lot. So it's, it's a wide variety of items. So that's why we talk about when we look at development permits, you want to have all these different types of development listed. Because a lot of times people just kind of go on autopilot and go, okay, all I got to worry about structures. I don't need to worry about grading, paving, filling, excavating, you know, I don't have to worry about it. I don't have to worry about drainage facilities, right? Or sometimes you have um, a site plan that doesn't have drainage facilities on there um, or it's an unmapped stream or different things. So you want to make sure um, that you have all these items on your development permit. And then when you sit down doing over the counter consultation, exactly what are you proposing to do on the lot is really important. So again, and then requesting a site plan to delineate the special flood hazard area, as well as have an existing and proposed development on the parcel. And then that also can go with, let's say you have planning and zoning in your community. If there's certain setback requirements that you have for different lots, or let's say that I'm in the city of Franklin, I have my uh, main uh, dwelling and I wanna have one accessory, Let's say I have an accessory and then I want another <laughs> accessory shed. Like I want a she shed for all my uh, cooking supplies that I and baking supplies that I have in my house or whatever. Then Shanna is going to say to me, no, Amy, you have your principal. You have one accessory. You can't have another one. So again, making sure you have that site plan that has existing and proposed development on there can also intertwine with your land use regulations, your planning, your zoning. And if someone's trying to propose something that's not allowable, um, you can kind of get um, alerted to that very early on in the process. 
Show the permitting guide. So the permitting guide really details the standards and procedures for various types of development uh, for floodplain in a community. It specifies certain kind of standards and making sure that they're uniformly applied and enforced. So really, this is just kind of our gift to you guys as far as um, if you look at the flood damage prevention regulations, if I were to ask you guys how many of you have read it cover to cover, maybe we would have half, maybe we wouldn't, maybe we'd have more than that, maybe we wouldn't. But this is kind of a, a, a quick cheat sheet to kind of help you guys if somebody comes in and has questions, right? Because a lot of times, um, you know, like when I came into this position, <laughs> It'll be nine years in April if time flies when you're having fun, right? So when I came into this, there wasn't <laughs> a lot of administrative procedures, right? There wasn't a lot of stuff for me to look at to go, okay, Amy, this is what you need to do. So one of the things that's been a blessing of having Julius is that, you know, we're kind of looking at starting from the bottom um, and working our way up is it how do we equip you guys with just doing the basics of floodplain management? So really this is just a nice kind of um, standard operating procedure and SOP for local floodplain administrators. So what's really great about having this guide is that it lists out, okay, how do I do a mapping determination? Where do I start? Because a lot of times, um, even being the state coordinator, like FEMA doesn't necessarily have a lot of guidance for state coordinators on what to do when I started nine years ago, right? They kind of gave me a couple things to read. Well, that's great, but if someone's calling me and I, they have questions, what do I do? How do I how do I tackle this? So we understand sometimes the frustration and kind of um, the angst that you have when you're trying to do this, but this permitting guide really should be. Um, a document that you have handy whenever someone is doing a floodplain development. It just should be because it has everything listed out there. Um, it is in a PDF, so you can, you know, even do the search and find if you're looking for a certain topic that you're not quite sure um, what to do. But again, this has steps, um, just being able to do a mapping determination, and then it has the steps for requesting a development permit um, beyond that. So, yes. I mean, okay. We had a question, I think, from Michael had his hands raised. I, I'm not sure if he still has his hands, but we had a question. Somebody had their hands raised. I think it was Michael, but Michael, did you have a question? I saw hands raised from you. Oh, we don't have a Michael on. Somebody had their hands raised. OK, all right, never mind. That's OK. Um, if you guys have questions, just put them in the chat um, as we go along and then having a, a development process. Right. So there are different kind of standards for different types of development within the flood damage prevention regulations as far as for residential, non-residential, um, which could be commercial buildings and have a proper elevations based upon what flood zone is in. Crawl space construction one square inch per one square foot. So again, you think about being identical. If you have a 1500 square foot home, you have 1500 um, square inches of vents. And then also we've been trying to do more outreach on uh, improvements for structures using a substantial damage, substantial improvement, cost estimate uh, worksheet. And then also having some sort of substantial damage, substantial improvement procedures. Because a lot of times when we go to different communities, um, there isn't really a, a set standard for if there is a, a disaster, or there's a flood event. Um, you know, sometimes we have people say, well, um, you know, TEMA is going out and doing damage assessments. That's good enough. Mm, no, it's not. Because as a floodplain administrator, you want to go out and identify which structures have sustained damage and to what level. If it's 50 percent or greater, it's considered substantial damage. If it's 50% or less, you've got to document that. Some communities have cumulative clauses where they go back five years. Some go back 10 years. So again, when there is a disaster, um, if I'm filing a, a flood insurance claim, uh, sometimes I need that letter from the community to say, no, it wasn't substantially damaged, or yes, it was. Um, and FEMA is also um, now starting to kind of look at kind of doing audits with communities to say, okay, you had a flood event. Um, where's the documentation? Where's the letters? How many, what number of structures were damaged? Uh, where's all the letters? So kind of like after the Waverly flood, 
Larry Lascure had to go and do um, damage assessments as well as Amanda Height in Humphreys County. And they went out and did damage assessments and they have the letters. And I know I could pick up the phone today and call them and say um, how many structures uh, were substantially damaged, how many were not. They can give me that answer, right? And so Larry always jokes and says, I've been baptized by flood. <laughs> and he knows the National Flood Insurance Program better now because of this flood event. But we don't want to necessarily have that same sort of situation happen in other communities because, again, as my partner in crime, Julius is a substantial damage king. Um, he, <laughs> well, really, you're the subject matter expert that that's one of his favorite things to um, train on is substantial damage. So one thing that we want to kind of work on with communities um, moving forward this year and probably next year is start working on having substantial damage plans um, and procedures in place. Because like if Julius was to go on vacation for several months and I was his backup <laughs> and I had to do substantial damage determinations, would it be as good as Julius? Would it be as smooth sailing as he um, shows everyone? Maybe it would be, maybe it wouldn't be. So that's why we want to try to have procedures and different things in place to help folks with that. Also looking at utilities, making sure they're elevated and anchored. If there's stream alterations, um, whether it's mapped, unmapped, or floodway development, uh, having an engineering analysis done. And then um, also based upon what special flood hazard area the development is located in, whether it's zone A, zone AE, shaded zone X or specific standards, and then manufactured homes and recreational vehicles. So all these different things are listed out within the standards, within the permitting guide that you guys can take a look at to know um, what to do. Yeah, and the other plug to make for the permitting guys, guys, it's your document. Feel free to make changes to it. Feel free to add your own stuff to it. If you have resources or checklists that you have already created, added on to it this is your document feel free to make changes feel free to add to it this is just kind of giving you a foundation to build off on it so if you already have great procedures in place already have things use the permitting guide as just a supplement if you don't have anything you don't have to reinvent the wheel when i came on with amy and cheyenne um, to tennessee my goal was try to be proactive so when Amy talks about the substantial damage plans and the training, it's trying to be proactive. So in that way, we're not reacting every time something happens in Tennessee, whether that's a flooding event, a tornado, earthquake, whatever causes the damage and that properties in special flood has there, you have to go out there and assess it. So my goal is trying to be proactive, especially with Amy's for us to get out there to communities and say, hey, what do you have in place? What don't you have in place? Okay, where do we have to start off? So in that way, if something happens, like a, unfortunately not a Waverly happens in Tennessee, you know, Larry will be better prepared for that event versus trying to like, okay, what do I have to do now? You know, there's flooding, there's damages. Okay, what do I have to go out there and do as part of my compliance to be an NFIP program? So a lot of things that we do in here may seem a lot right now, but it's basically setting us up to, Make sure that all 402 communities in Tennessee have a good foundation for NFIP program. If you didn't, if you wasn't doing anything in the past before, just let us know. Hey, Amy. Hey, Julius. You know, I'm new to this. We haven't necessarily been doing what we're supposed to be doing. Just be honest and transparent and upfront with us. Our goal is to be there to help you guys. So we'll sit down, create a specific plan, a specific direction for your individual community. Because no two communities are the same in Tennessee. So, but the biggest thing for me with any community is just be upfront, be honest, be transparent. Let us know what are your difficulties, what are your challenges, and we'll work with you to figure out a plan moving forward. So, so that's just it. When we have the office hours on Mondays definitely reach out to us you know don't wait till things hit the fan and you you know in, in a firestorm and now you're calling us to put the fire out for you be proactive reach out to us as early as possible let us know what's going on and we'll work with you guys so there's nothing we haven't seen there's nothing we haven't done in terms of trying to help a community out so definitely be proactive reach out to us permitting guide is another great resource but it's not it's a resource until you use it so if you're not using it and it's on the shelf and you're calling us, we're going to say, hey, we're going to take you right back to the permitting guy and says, hey, have you gone through the permitting guide? Because all the questions you're asking us are right there for you in the permitting guide. 
Yeah, I think that's a great point because sometimes when I go and I do an audit or I just do community visit, people kind of always sit there and they look kind of nervous or whatever. And I sit there and say, I'm not your adversary, I'm your advocate. And again, we have seen a lot of things, we've experienced a lot of things, we've heard a lot of things. So there's really nothing I don't think that you could say to either one of us would necessarily shock us. So again, if you feel like you're struggling, um, you know, again, once we're done with this um, webinar today, if you guys just want to email and say, hey, Amy, can you give me a call? Hey, Julius, can you give me a call? Hey, can we schedule some time on Monday? I just want to talk to you guys about some things. Um, and, you know, be more than happy to do that. So we always try to have like an open door policy. Um, so, you know, reach out. So this is just an example of a sample permit. Um, this is the example of the fillable PDF, and it really is comprehensive as far as detailing the nature, the location, the type of development within a floodplain, and then making sure that there's other uh, type of human activities are considered as far as alterations of a structure through additions, demolition and remodeling. Um, one that we're having that, you know, we rewrite the uh, flood damage prevention regulations talking about fencing. Um, some communities have fencing standards, some don't, some if it's more than a certain height or a certain length. It's kind of inconsistent all over the board, just being honest. So we're going to work on that, uh, whether or not there's going to be a retaining wall, moving and placement and uh, remanufactured or mobile homes, campgrounds, storage of equipment and vehicles or materials. So if you have storage yards or salvage yards. So there's much more to think about than just um, that definition per se. This is just a much more comprehensive um, permit that you can use in your community. And then making sure that um, before any party undertakes development within a floodplain, um, again, that in section 59.1, the definition of development, and then just making sure that other um, human activities that we just talked about a moment ago are included in that. I'm not going to read all that to you because we just talked about it, but making sure that all the I's are dotted, T's are crossed for development and taking a holistic and a comprehensive uh, view for development is really important. And again, that's where having the over-the-counter consultation is so important. Just being able to talk to somebody and go, okay, where is property located? I see what flood is in a zone AE. And then what are you proposing to do on the site? And looking at the site plan is really crucial. So we also have the permit review checklist. So some of you guys say, okay, Amy and Julius, it's great that I got to look up a map. It's great that I got to have a document to check off what they're doing. Now, what do I do? So this is kind of, again, it's kind of like building blocks. We're kind of going maybe up to the first floor, the second floor of the house, or in Julius's case, the high rise. <laughs> <laughs> he knows what I'm talking about. Okay, so <laughs> you, have, you have the development permit, you have the site plan, and now you got to go, okay, what do I got to make sure that I do, right? What, what do we need to make sure that we review and we have a checklist for so that it's compliant? So this just kind of builds upon that. And having a permit review checklist is really compares the applicant's development permit, any other additional documentation that's needed for compliance. So, you know, making sure that you have, um, let's say on the development permit, that you make sure you have the flood zone, you have the panel number, you have the date, so on and so forth, right? Kind of making sure that the site plan has various elements to it. Um, and then looking at what zone is in, if it's in a zone AE, if it's in a zone A, what else do I need to be doing for floodplain um, development in my community? So it really has um, this review checklist is really uh, the bread and butter as far as documentation of elevation information, confirmation of foundation openings, and then if there's any kind of stream encroachments, do we have an engineering analysis, so on and so forth. So it really has um, different things. And then as Julius was talking about a moment ago, saying that this is your document, there we encourage you to print out some of these checklists and kind of go down through with a red pen and go, yes, no, uh, not applicable. So do you kind of have standards and different things? Because um, a lot of the times in this job, I'm kind of the complaint department. Like I had someone yesterday that wanted me to tell her an attorney so that she could sue a community. Uh, and I wrote her back and said, I don't know. Um, but anyway, um, again, 
if you kind of have this review checklist, if somebody has questions or a citizen or a stakeholder, or county commissioner, or city uh, or alderman or whatever, um, you know, if they have questions whether certain things were done, this is kind of a way to cover your rear end and make sure that you um, have all the documentation that you reviewed it uh, thoroughly to make sure that it's compliant. It's really important. So again, as we talked about having a checklist, making sure that the flood zone designation is done. Do you have the firm panel? Do you have the firm panel uh, date? What's the base flood elevation? How is it determined? Now you notice when you look at number six, if it's a firm, <coughs> wrong. So again, if it's in a zone AE, um, it should be using the um, flood insurance study profile. And then your required free board, is it one foot? Is it two? Is it three? What is it? And then required finished floor elevation, lot grading, and then whether or not there's a letter of map change, was it approved or denied? Um, and then whether or not there was flood resistant materials used below the base flood elevation plus required free board. So there's information here that you guys can use. You can check yes, you can check no, you can um, put that, write that information on here. Um, again, it's a tool for you to use. And then for zone AE, what's the finished floor elevation for all new and substantial improvements in the special flood hazard area? Um, is it to the BFE and required free board? Um, one of the things that we notice sometimes when we do um, audits, and I know I'm probably infamous for checking every single elevation certificate, but you want to make sure that if you have that before you're issuing the certificate, certificate of occupancy, you're looking at B9 versus C2A, right? You want to make sure that you're looking at that. Is it one foot above if I'm using just the statewide model regulations and provide the top of the bottom floor elevation? Is it on a FEMA elevation certificate, right? Do you have, uh, is there an attached garage? What's the top of the slab elevation? And then looking to see if you have crawl space. Do you have the total number of all permanent openings? Um, Again, we were reviewing um, yesterday an elevation certificate for a community, and they said that they had a crawl space, and they didn't have. They said that the structure was, let's say, 1,500 square feet. The garage, the attached garage, was 633 square feet, but they checked that they had engineered openings, but there was no number of openings, and there was no total uh, net square inches of vents. So. The um, building inspector had sent that to me and said, hey, can you look at it? And she caught it and said, hey, they're missing these things. But again, before you issue that certificate of occupancy, you know, looking at the building diagram, making sure you understand some of those, looking at the pictures and going, OK, does it have this or not? And then for A zones, making sure the top of the bottom floor for all new and substantial improvement uh, of structures is three feet above the highest adjacent grade. As I spoke about a little bit earlier, making sure you have a site plan from the surveyor and have in all four corners of um, the structure, the elevations, and then determining which one's the highest adjacent grade, as well as um, being um, three feet above that. Uh, one of the communities that I um, help do a lot of permits, um, the surveyor had a site plan for a zone A and actually put in the notes um, the elevations of the four corners, which one was the highest and that the structure was going to be built three feet above that. So again, making sure that you have that notation, whether it's on a site plan, whether the surveyor writes a letter, but making sure you have that in case there's ever questions in the future or someone thinks that the structure is not compliant. Again, having the documentation and it really doesn't take the surveyor that long to write that up. And then making sure that you have the total area of all permanent openings um, on there. And then it's within one foot above adjacent grade, either interior or exterior. As we've talked about a lot through the years, the comment section on the elevation certificate is really your best friend, right? Because if someone's going to pick that up, or let's say that you send that elevation certificate to me and you say, hey, Amy, review it. If they don't have anything for C2E, I think, um, you want to make sure that they have that information listed in the comment section as far as when they're putting in the vents is the interior exterior grade what's the elevation of um, the machinery equipment and the location so again anybody should be able to pick up the elevation certificate and look at it and know 
um, various elements and aspects to the um, construction of the structure and whether or not it's in compliance with um, your flood damage prevention regulation. So again, having the lowest elevation machinery or equipment servicing the building to be three feet above the highest adjacent grade as well, um, and making sure that duct work is either placed um, above the BFE or sealed from flood waters. Um, so again, there's information on the FEMA 348. And then floodway encroachment. Um, I think I'm probably going to be infamous for this for the rest of my life. Um, making sure that there's an engineering review that's being done. Um, again, if it's a uh, zone AE with floodway, it has to have a no rise or um, has to be sent to FEMA for a conditional letter of map revision prior to construction to bless it from FEMA and then uh, to revise the flood insurance rate maps and the flood insurance study. Um, you're going to follow that up within six months of construction with a letter of map revision. So again, making sure you know that. And then um, again, the placement of manufactured homes is not permitted unless it's within an existing manufactured home park. And then um, also having free of obstructions below the BFE. So those are some of the things for floodway encroachment. So this is just a good checklist to kind of look at different things. If it's zone AE without a floodway, again, there has to be an engineering analysis, has to be provided for any development. Um, and again, no fill shall be placed within a zone AE without a floodway or zone A or unmapped areas, unless there's an engineering analysis. Placement of mobile homes um, has to have an engineering analysis as well and then making sure that you have free of obstructions below the BFE. So all these things, you know, you can kind of look at this and go, do I have it? Yes or no. If you don't have it and you need it, it should be an e -e -e. I got to stop the, um, I can't issue the certificate of occupancy. I've got to stop, maybe issue stop work order until I have this documentation is really important. So again, non-residential floodproof structures. A couple months ago, we did um, a floodproofing webinar that kind of gave you everything that you could ever want from FEMA technical bullets in three, making sure that you have a flood proofing certificate, you have a maintenance plan um, and an emergency plan um, and making sure that um, the finished floor is below the BFE is to be engineered to be flood proof to one foot greater than above the BFE or elevated um, to the required flood elevation. So again, making sure that you have that flood proofing certificate filled out, it's finalized, that you have um, flood protection, flood barriers must be identified on the plans, and then a flood proofing operation procedure is also required. So a lot of times I've seen in the past where there's a flood proofing certificate and the engineer just signs off on it and there's absolutely positively no backup documentation um, only God knows what's being flood proofed or what materials are being used. So if you don't have anything in your hands, you have absolutely positively nothing. That's where you just need to say, okay, I, I can't issue a certificate of occupancy. I can't issue development permit until I have this flood proofing certificate and I have all the, the supplemental information to make sure that it's being done correctly. So if you ever do have a structure that wants that someone is desiring to have it flood proof, I would encourage you to watch that video that we did um, on flood proofing and to also look at the technical bulletin three because it really has a lot of great information of things that should be part of that um, package to make sure that it's compliant. Because a lot of times if you don't really have enough information, um, you know, think about whether it be your friend, whether it be a family member or somebody that you know that is their business. If it isn't flood proofed correctly, they're going to lose their inventory um, and they're going to be really hurt financially. So you want to just keep that in mind as well. So again, accessory structures, making sure that it's <laughs> for um, storage, parking and access. I did it right. Spa treatment. Spa treatment. Spa treatment. Um, you want to make sure um, that it's not used for human habitation. Um, it's not climate controlled that there's flood resistant materials is anchored to resist flotation. Um, there's permanent openings, flood vents, and then um, it really, the accessory structure should be of low value. It shouldn't be something that's worth, let's say half a million dollars. Um, and then service facility, making sure the, the electric is elevated above the BFE or flood proofed. So again, if you're gonna have that she shed, he shed, <laughs> <laughs> 
you're just going to have a structure, accessory structure out in the backyard. You want to make sure that it's anchored and elevated to resist flotation and that it's not going to be, let's say, a mother-in-law suite or Auntie Amy um, suite when she comes to visit. You know, you just want to make sure that um, you have all that um, done correctly. And then remodeling whether or not um, it's going to be a substantial improvement. So that's where you have the substantial damage, substantial improvement, uh, cost estimate sheet where all the various elements that uh, should be figured in um, should be listed. Sometimes when communities have building codes, they say we're just going to use what the um, IBC has listed, um, you know, the monetary value per square foot. And if someone's only doing 200 square feet, we're just going to go on that value. We're not going to worry about the rest of it. But for NFIP purposes, you really want to use that cost estimate sheet that's within the substantial damage, substantial improvement desk reference. Um, and then, you know, just making sure that uh, any kind of improvements, any kind of repairs are being documented with the true value. And then making sure that you have that package completed and signed. Um, before construction starts and then if it's remodel of uninhabited um, space to habitable space if it's below the bfe is prohibited so for instance we had an example where someone had let's say a garage and the finished floor was below the bfe and they wanted to turn it into livable space that is prohibited that's where we talk about having um a, a deed restriction or a non-conversion agreement to make sure that um that isn't done whether it's in a zone um, A or zone AE. And then really there should be no remodel or conversion of space below the BFE that's allowed. And then no new additions, vertical or lateral for pre or post firm structures without being elevated on an elevated foundation designed to new construction specifications within the flood damage prevention regulations. So essentially if I have a house, let's say it's pre firm, let's say, um, it's my childhood home back home, and it was built back in 26. Um, that was way before the National Flood Insurance Program. But if it was in the floodplain, and let's say that we were going to put an addition on the back, if we're going to put an addition on the back, it has to follow the NFIP regulations. You can't say, oh, well, you know, Amy, I just want to build it lower because aesthetically it looks the same as everything else. Because it's new construction and you're um, obtaining a permit, it has to fall under the new NFIP regulations. The same for a post firm um, structure. So if I'm already in the National Flood Insurance Program, let's say my community joined in 2010, I'm pulling a permit in 2022. Um, if that structure was built, let's say in 2012, and I'm putting an addition on in 2020, that's uh, 2023. So if I'm putting an addition on in 2023, um, I have to follow new construction and I have to elevate that area and make sure that that finished floor is one foot above the base flood elevation if I'm in zone AE or that it's three feet above the highest adjacent grade. So again, can't get a, well, I don't want to do it kind of thing because eventually some of the structures that they're building non, non-compliance, if they get damaged, the whole thing has to be um brought into compliance and the same thing with if you're doing additions you want to make sure that it meets your current flood damage prevention regulations so one of my favorite things to talk about is the elevation certificate checklist people kind of laugh at me because i said it's the closest thing to having me sit beside you <laughs> when you review the certificate so again um FEMA currently is um, revising the FEMA elevation certificate. It's still under review. So this probably may or may not remain for the rest of the year. Um, just depends upon how fast FEMA um, approves those changes. And once they do approve those changes, we'll have uh, training on that and we'll also revise this. But currently the elevation certificate that everybody is using, this kind of has everything and anything you could ever want. You have the red text that kind of gives you additional information. And really it's just a uh, verifying that the structure was built into compliance with the community's flood damage prevention regulations. And then there's documentation of elevation information, foundation openings, machinery equipment and anchoring and elevation information. So this is what the elevation certificate looks like. Again, it has to be done by a licensed Tennessee surveyor. 
And then this is just a checklist here. So each of the sections, whether it's A, whether it's B, C, D, E, F, there's different instructions on all this. So there's a lot written on here. And I think the biggest thing is making sure that the building use, whether it's residential, non-residential, addition or accessory is listed. Um, having the correct building diagram number on there is important. Oh, I'm sorry, you got to open mic. Give me a second. On. Are oh, you continue? I got you. Go ahead. So making sure that you have the correct building diagram number um, and that you have the correct elevation information. If there's crawl space, do you have um, the correct number of openings, whether it's engineered or not? I'm not going to necessarily read through all this because you guys, most of you guys have copies of this that you can look at. But again, it's the closest thing to having me sit beside you to review elevation certificates. So if <laughs> I should send a copy of this to Jennifer. OK, so if you guys have questions or if you have building inspectors that are going to be looking at elevation certificates, um, a lot of times they are not as well versed as what I would like them to be with elevation certificates. So, you know. You're a little bit late from Christmas, but if you want to give the gift that keeps on giving, um, ask your building inspectors to use this when they're reviewing structures that are in the floodplain. Now, ultimately, you're going to be looking at it as well, but if they're out in the field and they see different things, or if they're reviewing elevation certificates for completion before they issue the certificate of occupancy, this is a great resource to use. And then again, section B, making sure that you have the correct community name, community identification number, um, firm panel, firm panel index dates, flood zone, base flood elevation should be to a tenth of a foot. Source of the base flood elevation should be from the FIS profile or the Army Corps of Engineers or FEMA. And then making sure that if you got it from another source, has to be state or federal, having that backup documentation. And if they did use the flood insurance study profile, if they check that, there should be a worksheet attached to the elevation certificate. And then the elevation datum should be reflective of um, the flood insurance rate map. So this is just section C. Again, um, elevation certificates, when I come and visit you and I do an audit, I want to see it marked finished construction. Every single place that I've been to this year and I've looked at elevation certificates is um, construction drawings or under construction. And so one of my surveyors says and has said to me repeatedly before, said, well, no one ever asked me for a finished construction elevation certificate. And if they don't ask me, I'm not going to give it to them. That doesn't help. So again, before you issue that certificate of occupancy, please, please, please make sure it's finished construction. Like Bart says when he does his training, you want to make sure that the grading is done and the grass is starting to grow. So, um, you know, it is something that if we see that a lot when we're doing audits, we will ask you to go get um, finished construction elevation certificates. Um, and then there's different standards for benchmark utilized. Um, and then kind of going through C2, A through H, making sure that all the elevations are documented. Again, if you're in a zone AE, if you're using a statewide model regulations being one foot above the base flood elevation, and then making sure that you have the highest adjacent grade, lowest adjacent grade. If there's any kind of um, deck or steps, um, looking at structural support that you have the elevation information there. And then um, for section D is talking about where the latitude and longitude, longitude provided by a uh, licensed Tennessee land surveyor, yes or no. And then um, they can have comments in here about C2E for machinery equipment. And they should have something in here and where the location of that is. So section um, E is talking about areas for um, flood zone A or AO that doesn't have base flood elevation information, making sure that the top of the bottom floor, including basement or crawl space, is compliant with it to be at least three feet above the highest adjacent grade. And then the top of the bottom floor um, enter the height um, above or below the lowest adjacent grade. And then if there's a crawl space for um, building diagram six through nine, um, having the elevation information above or below the highest adjacent grade. Um, also for um, E3, having it for an attached garage. 
and then looking at the top of the platform of machinery and equipment for E4. And then if you have a zone AO, you're going to fill out this information. If the flood depth number is available, is the top of the bottom floor elevated in accordance with your community's regulations? You're either going to mark, you're either going to put an elevation in there, or you're going to mark yes or no, and then put the elevation. So not a lot of communities have zone AO, but because it's a nationwide um, document, they're going to have everything on here. Um, so again, we also have information on what's an attached garage versus an enclosure. So again, the triggering factor is living space. If there's living space above, the garage is considered an enclosure. And then um, if there's no living space above, it's considered an attached garage. So again, you have the triggering factor as far as no living space above the garage. So this was an issue that we had with um, some of the community rating system uh, communities when they um, their elevation certificates were reviewed. There were some questions on this. So they gave some great information. So we have this in here. So in case you have a surveyor that maybe has never been to training or it's been a while, or maybe they do come to training, but they're still not quite sure. This is a really good resource to give um, to your surveyors. So again, we have instructions for the Tennessee Property Viewer. It's a great website that we have to help obtain um, flood determination information. Um, there's various ways you can go on here. You can select the county, you can select the search criteria, whether it's parcel, owner name, subdivision name, or address, and then you can click on all that drop down. I believe there's 88 out of 95, um, or maybe it's 85. I think it's 85. Oh, it is 85, okay. It's 85, I was just trying to do it off memory. It is 85 out of the 95 counties um, that utilize this website. So it's a vast majority of communities in Tennessee that utilize this where you can print um, a PDF. You know, if you don't necessarily have GIS in your community, this is just a great resource to use. Um, and again, so you're looking at this to see, okay, is my property in or out of a special flood hazard area? So you can see over here on the left, zone A is shaded. It shows that it's in the special flood hazard area. And then on the right, um, we have Julius's candy cane. I had to do it. Um, <laughs> of floodway. <laughs> Every Wednesday when I go to my boss, um, we have a staff meeting. She has um, peppermints. It looks like candy canes. I always think of you and laugh. She has a little basket of them. But anyway, on the right-hand side, this shows that uh, the lots are in um, the floodway. And one of the nice things is that it does have, um, if it's already an existing lot and there's a structure on there, it does have that imagery that you can see um, if there's already structures that are in um, the floodplain or the floodway. So if it's already developed, or let's say they want to do an addition or something. So you have that information here. Again, you're going to go on the website. And then the screen should look like this here where you're going to see Tennessee Property Viewer. And then you're also going to do the drop down to select a, a county. You're going to choose the type parcel number, owner name, property address, or subdivision. And then um, you can also um, have further information for number three. So you can do the parcel number. Um, one thing that I will say, guys, is that when you guys ask questions sometimes, like parcel numbers are kind of not correct. Or one time I was doing a, a site plan review for a community and on the site plan, it actually had the wrong parcel number. So you want to make sure that even if they have a parcel number listed on the site plan, that you go into the Tennessee Property Viewer or if you have your own GIS website and make sure that the surveyor actually put the correct number on there. Because sometimes every once in a while we find that it's not correct. So you want to make sure that, you know, we're talking potato and potato that is all the same and we're not, you know, doing something completely different. So again, you're going to hit the search. You can put in the address. This is an example below. Um, so all this being said, I know a couple, what, probably this past summer, I think in September, we did a whole shebang and we went over every single thing, uh, for the permitting guide, but we just wanted to do this as a refresher to kind of say that the, the document is available for you to use. 
as a floodplain administrator, if you have additional staff that helps you, it's a great tool and a great resource. And it also kind of helps with the administrative side of the house because some of you guys, you're brand new to this. Some of you are brand new to government and you're trying to think, okay, if I'm going to be the point person, how do I want my program to look? You know, some of us really excel on organization. Some of us struggle. And so if you do struggle or you're not quite sure where to start, this is a great resource to be able to say, okay, I, I can use this permitting guide. I can use the PDF one if I want to have a fillable PDF. If I don't want to mess with that, I can use the Word document, but I already have this already together, right? So I can already uh, review and evaluate development applications in my community using this. Uh, I have information within the guide on how to do a, um, a floodplain determination. And then I also have the specific standards written out for me so that if I don't want to flip through the whole entire flood damage prevention regulations, I can look at this guide, flip a couple pages, see what I need and be able to tell an applicant what they need to do. And then also reviewing elevation certificates for accuracy. So again, you can be that rock star at work. I know that's what everybody dreams to be, right? You can be the star of the show. And then Julius and I will be the backup singers. <laughs> Although you probably want to mute my microphone because I can't sing. I can't have it all, right? But you can have us in the background to help you, right? Because you guys really um, are the stars of the show for your local community. You are the point person. Some of you guys like floodplain management. Some of you guys don't like floodplain management. But if you have to do it as part of your job, um, enthusiasm can help you a long way. Um, and learning this program, it is valuable because, again, your home or someone's business is probably the greatest asset that they'll ever have. Um, and so you want to make sure that you help them uh, protect it as much as possible and try to reduce flood risk as much as possible in your community. So I think with that, do you guys have any questions or comments? Julius, do you have any parting words? Um, I would just say a terrific job as always, Amy. Um, this document, like I said in the beginning, is a livable document that's forever going to be edited and make changes. Um, it's a document we designed it with you guys in mind. Um, so if you definitely have feedback, you things you want to see, I know some of the things Amy and I want to put in there, some flow charts for different um, situations to kind of help help you guys out as well too. But definitely utilize the documents. If you have an open audit or community assistance visit um, from either Amy and I, one of the things that we're going to ask for corrective actions is having procedures, is having checklists. So guess what? You have this document that you could utilize and say, hey, Julius, hey, Amy, this is what I'm going to use for my community when it comes to administrative procedures. That checks a lot of things off your corrective actions list. So if you have an, a CAV from myself or Amy or anything in the future, we're going to ask you guys to create those documents. So you have the option of one, you could implement this document or you could create yours from scratch. My recommendation would be utilize this document. If you want to make changes, make changes to it. Work smarter, not hard is one of my biggest things I always try to do. Don't try to reinvent the wheel, guys. Don't try to stress yourself out. Okay, how am I going to implement NFIP program regulations for my community. I have to start back from scratch. You don't have to start from scratch. We have given you guys the foundational to build off it. Make changes, add to it. We can continue going to be updating the document. It's a great resource and there's going to be continual resources that Amy and I are going to be continue giving to you guys. So in that way, you guys are not starting from scratch. So everything that we're doing, yeah, there's going to be some growing pains. There's going to be some challenges, but in the long run, it's going to pay off. So definitely um, reach out to us. Great job as always, Amy. I'm glad to kick off 2023 with, uh, with you guys on our first webinar for the year. Um, what we will do um, now that I am the Lone Ranger, I will be sending out certificates and things. So um, please give a little bit of patience um, till I can get all that sent out. Um, we will be sending out other um, calendar invites um, upcoming for the year for you guys. Uh, the Tennessee Association of Floodplain Managers uh, newsletter should be coming out any day now. So we'll be sending that as well. It does have information for the upcoming uh, conference we are going to be having in Franklin, Tennessee this year. 
um, I believe I think it's the 13th through the 15th, but I'm not sure. So, but it, we'll be sending that out. And then if you guys have any questions or you want to have individualized training or you want to have a Monday marathon with us and talk about everything and anything <laughs> for plane <laughs> management related, let us know. Um, and I think with that, um, yeah, and you guys get a link. Amy will upload the video to YouTube, and then we'll also send out. Amy, can we get the FM, FMPG posted to the TIMA's NFIP website and as well as the association website, so that way folks could access it? One is going to be easier than the other. We'll talk offline. Okay, Okay. cool. All right, whichever option is easier to get it out to everybody, so that way we could just send everyone that link. So. Did you say 18 by 24? Yeah. Does anybody else have any questions, comments, concerns? Okay. All right. Well, with that, we're going to close the Did webinar. You copy some of this? Did you copy some of this? Yeah, the first. Uh, you good, Amy? The. Uh, oh, I'm good. Open mic. Okay. Yeah. No, that was me. So the bottom, the bottom. Right. The bottom two. Okay, go ahead. All right, Amy, I think that's all we got. Okay. Thanks, everybody. See you guys right. next month, everybody. All on Mondays.